Now it's here. The new Boeing 757, the most advanced, most fuel-efficient commercial jet ever built. It's going to help Eastern hold down the cost of flying for years to come. Why Delta keeps flying, the 757, against all logic. Something about Delta's flight schedule slams straight into aviation common sense. It is the first day of September 2025, and most carriers have long since sold, parked, or scrapped their Boeing 757s, condemning them as fuel-guzzling antiques. Boeing shut the assembly line nearly two decades ago. Airbus trumpets that its A321 extra-long range matches the same routes on fewer pounds of kerosene, and Wall Street analysts chant, newer, lighter, cheaper. Yet Delta, an airline famous for ruthless spreadsheet discipline, still cranks more than 120 of these sleek pencil jets into the dawn sky every single morning. Holiday surge out of Atlanta? 757. Fog-bound shuttle from LaGuardia to Orlando? 757 again. The mystery is obvious and maddening. What hidden value does Delta see that everyone else has overlooked? To trace the answer, rewind to the adrenaline-soaked early years after deregulation in the 1980s. The 757 rolled out of Renton looking like a machine from tomorrow. Two hulking Rolls-Royce RB200 engines, a supercritical wing, and a digital cockpit that banished the flight engineer. With roughly 200 seats and true coast-to-coast -coast legs, the jet promised wide-body payload on single-aisle costs while whispering through noise-sensitive curfews. Eastern, British Airways, Northwest, and a younger Delta shoved deposit checks across the table because the brochure sounded unbeatable. Fly farther, haul more, spend less, annoy nobody. But aviation tastes change faster than an approach clearance. Twin Isle siblings like the 767 and Airbus 330 captured glamorous long-haul expansion, while lighter A320s and 737 next-generation models undercut domestic trip costs by thousands of dollars. The 757 suddenly sat in an awkward middle seat too heavy for 60-minute hops, too narrow-bodied for ballooning trunk routes. Boeing flirted with a re-engine, hesitated, and in the spring of 2005 waved goodbye to the last fuselage after a touch over 1,050 frames. One by one, the launch customers moved on. American mothballed its fleet under blistering Mojave sun. British Airways pivoted to Airbus narrow bodies, and charter outfits parted out the stragglers for quick cash. Delta, though, never signed that obituary. While rivals queued for fresh carbon wing darlings, Delta quietly scooped up gently used 757s for cents on the dollar and tucked them into hangars at Hartsfield and Minneapolis. To outsiders, the move looked nostalgic or reckless. Inside Delta, network planners saw an unpolished gem whose mix of thrust, range, and cabin size still solved a razor-specific equation. Runway length, stage distance, and capital budget click together like tumblers in a lock. Cracking that lock is the first step toward understanding Delta's latest contrarian masterstroke. The bargain fell into Delta's lap like an unclaimed lottery ticket. In late 2011, United Continental and American were busy wooing Airbus and Boeing sales teams for fresh metal, pumping press releases about fuel burn and photovoltaic bright mood lighting. Meanwhile, a quiet auction in the Arizona desert offered nearly two dozen ex-Kingfisher and American Trans Air 757s for almost teardown value. Engines with more than half their life left, avionics already certified for reduced vertical separation minima, and cargo holds pre-wired for wide-band SATCOM. Yet no bidder raised a hand. Delta's fleet managers pounced. They negotiated power-by-the-hour maintenance deals with Pratt & Whitney, bundled heavy check slots into TechOps's calendar gaps, and signed leases rumored to sit below one-tenth the monthly nut on a new build narrow body. Translation, capital costs so low, it barely nudged the spreadsheet. One senior planner later quipped, we bought stage length, not paint. Refurb teams gutted cabins, slid in slimline seats, added satellite Wi-Fi, and sprayed the updated widget livery. By the time those frames rolled back onto flight lines, they looked brand new. Yet Delta's balance sheet showed an acquisition price less than the cost of a single A321neo engine set. Cheap is pointless unless the jet answers a question no other airplane can. This is where the 757 fits like a tailor-made suit. Picture a damp December dawn at John F. Kennedy. Delta wants to lift 190 souls to Edinburgh non-stop. 
A 321 Neo could make the mileage, but only by blocking extra fuel tanks and surrendering cargo. A Twin Isle 767 could breeze the route, yet its 240 plus seats would leave yawning rows of empties in winter. The 757, with its overpowered ERB 200 turbofans and narrow girth, leaps off runway 31 left, clears the North Atlantic in under seven hours, and slips onto Edinburgh's short tarmac without a weight penalty. That same afternoon, the jet turns south to Orlando, packed with holidaymakers, a mission swap that would clobber unit costs on a smaller single aisle. No other metal balances that triangle of thrust, range, and right-sized cabin so cleanly. Delta Layer's additional magic. Because the 757 shares a common type rating with the larger 767, the airline can schedule pilots across both fleets, smoothing vacations and sick calls without frantic reserve activation. Mechanics praise the airframe too. Its wing box inspections slot neatly into existing heavy check routines, and many spares interchange with parts already stocked for legacy 767s. What looks from the terminal like aging hardware reveals under the skin a low-risk, high-margin machine tailored for niche lanes nobody else wants or can afford to serve. On winter nights, the North Atlantic turns brutal, scattering jet streams like shredded foil, yet Delta's 757 swagger remains. Check the flight board, Boston to Reykjavik, New York to Shannon, Detroit to Dublin. These are routes too lean for a twin aisle, but too long for most single aisles. The 757 steps in wearing extended twin operations clearance, 280 minutes of single engine diversion authority, so it can arc high over the pole, trimming minutes and fuel. Its oversized Rolls-Royce lungs let it claw off icy runways at Keflavik, then land that same afternoon on Orlando concrete hotter than a griddle. Try that trick in an Embraer or an A321 Neo carrying belly freight and you will bump up against weight limits before the first suitcase reaches the belt. The jet's long, skinny wing dishes out wide body lift with single aisle drag, dropping block fuel enough to keep accountants smiling. Business class sells out, economy fills with students chasing shoulder season fares, and the spreadsheet tips green long before the cabin door shuts. Yet the airframe alone is only half the alchemy. The other half sits in Delta's crew scheduling suite and immense tech ops hangars. Because the 757 and the larger 767 share a common pilot type rating, same flight computers, near identical overhead panels, captains can bounce between fleets after a short differences course. That cross-fleet flexibility lets ops managers plug a reserve pilot into whichever tail number needs a driver, smoothing weather meltdowns without expensive deadheads. Maintenance rides the same synergy. Turbine techs who know the PW2000 series on the 767 transfer effortlessly to the slightly smaller PW2037 hung under the 757. Tooling, ground power carts, even hydraulic fittings match. The Atlanta component shop stocks thousands of rotables shared across the two fleets, slashing inventory cost. When Delta engineered the winglet retrofit, it bundled the install into scheduled sea checks eliminating ferry flights and extra downtime. Competitors who outsourced heavy checks to third-party MROs never had that freedom. Costs ballooned, and their 757s vanished soon after. So, why did everyone else abandon the type? Three bruises sealed the verdict. First, crude oil flirted with $100 a barrel in the early 2010s, and thirsty ERB 200 engines suddenly looked prehistoric beside geared turbofan newcomers. Second, the airframes reached age triggers that required Section 41 pressure bulkhead inspections and pricey corrosion work. Manageable if you run a tech ops empire, ruinous if you rent hangar slots overseas. Third, resale value cratered once Boeing confirmed there would be no restart or re-engine program. Airlines that depend on flipping assets need exit liquidity, but Delta plays the long game. Buy cheap, fly hard, squeeze every cycle. Different playbook, different outcome. The market did not kill the 757. It simply failed to look like Delta. That mismatch left an orphan fleet begging for adoption. And Delta, never sentimental, seized the prize. Delta's 757 comeback is no nostalgia tour. It is an engineering rebuild executed with race team urgency. Step inside Hangar 8 at Hartsfield after midnight, and you will find wings shrink-wrapped in plastic, technicians balanced on cherry pickers, and a whiteboard titled Life Extension Playbook. Move 1. 
Install blended winglets that stand taller than a linebacker's shoulder pads, trimming roughly 5% off cruise fuel burn and adding several hundred nautical miles of range. Move two, rip out amber cathode ray displays, drop in tablet-sized liquid crystal screens compliant with today's required navigation performance 21 standards, and hardwire the panel for future satellite data link. Move three, replace original overhead bins with sculpted, lightweight composites, freeing space for roller bags while shaving structural pounds. Move four, Lay a redesigned seat track grid so slimline seats can squeeze the count from 189 to 199 without stealing knee room. Move five, reinforce the wing roots with cold worked fasteners discovered during Delta's own teardown analysis, delaying fatigue limits by another 30,000 cycles. Move six, overhaul those Rolls-Royce Sur RB200 engines with TechOps developed ceramic coatings clawing back two points of specific fuel consumption. The result looks vintage only in archival photos. On the ramp, it punches far above its birth certificate. Steel and aluminum, however, age like athletes. They slow, they creak, they eventually retire. Pratt & Whitney warns its pool of serviceable PW2037 engines will tighten by the late 2020s, and an October 2024 Federal Aviation Administration directive now mandates ultrasonic scans of the forward pressure bulkhead every 4,000 cycles after scattered corrosion finds. Delta's planners accept the hourglass is draining. Choosing a successor, though, is trickier than rewriting a hub schedule. Airbus UO321 Extra Long Range promises about 4,700 nautical miles, yet delivery slots stretch well into the next decade and early operators report cabin altitude quirks at maximum range. Boeing 737-10 offers cockpit commonality, but lacks the legs to clear the North Atlantic in winter without payload penalties. Clean sheet, middle of the market concepts from both airframers remain PowerPoint art. For now, Delta hedges its bets. 50 firm, A321 extra long range orders, purchase rights on the Dash 10, and exploratory talks about 757 freighter conversions once passenger work winds down. Translation, the airline will not surrender these routes until a replacement equals or beats the mission on cost, range, and seat count. So, if your boarding pass shows a Boeing 757 this season, savor the ride. Feel the gut punch acceleration when two Rolls-Royce mills bellow to take off thrust. Hear the raw, metallic, snarl, modern geared fans hush behind carbon nacelles, and watch those shark-like winglets carve dawn haze as the aircraft climbs toward 37,000 feet. 37,000 feet in words. You are not merely crossing an ocean. You are sitting inside a live economics seminar. Delta's gamble proves the smartest airplane is not always the youngest. Sometimes it is the one whose thrust curve, floor plan, and maintenance ecosystem dovetail perfectly with a network map. When the final 757 eventually taxis into the desert, the roar will fade, but its lesson should echo through boardrooms. Value often hides in metal, everyone else writes off. Until that day, every Delta 757 remains both time machine and contrarian mascot. Grab the armrest and enjoy the history while it lasts.